This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, the minke whale that won't leave Harbor Grace. That whale's got to die, like humans got to die. Every animal dies, so it just happens that this one is in the community. I'm just hoping that the whale gets back out and goes back home into the ocean. Something like this brings, brings everybody, everybody together. Stranded in shallow water next to the SS Kyle, an adult minke whale gets freed but just keeps coming back. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper and we go immediately to Harbor Grace where Anthony Germain is standing by. So Anthony, people have been watching this whale all day. What's the latest? Well, Debbie, unfortunately, this, this magnificent creature behind me on this side of the Kyle, a lot of people surprised that an animal could actually make it this far up. It's just not doing very well. It's not breathing as, as much as it was earlier in the day. People had hoped that it might get rescued. But Megan Kwan, our colleague, she was here all day. I'll let her walk you through the story. Started early this morning when people here reported a whale beached in the harbor. Since then, dozens have gathered to catch a glimpse. At 9.30, the whale was over just a little left of the boat over there and uh, it looked like he got stranded on the I guess the sand there there's a sandbar that's an interesting something like this brings brings everybody everybody together the whale release and strandings group was called in to help free the whale they tried several times to coax it back out of the harbor until they got a closer look an adult minky whale that's uh, that had uh, stranded herself on the beach, uh, in, in shoal water, an uh, animal that did, body condition doesn't look pretty good. It's pretty thin. Uh, you can see some of the ribs and shoulder blade. Uh, it's, it's not. It's from seeing a uh, healthy whale. This is whale well, seems far from being healthy. Ledwell was able to free the whale at around noon today, but in fact, it wouldn't swim out past the Kyle shipwreck and kept turning around to swim ashore again. Now it's found yet another resting spot here in Harbor Grace. Those animals come into a place like this, uh, single animals, uh, because they, maybe they don't want to drown, or uh, and it's just resting on the resting on the bottom, where it, there's no pressure on his very little pressure on his lungs to breathe. Ledwell says there's not much that can be done. He doesn't want to tow it for fear of hurting it. Megan Kwan, CBC News, Harbor Grace. And as you can see, Debbie, people dropping by after work to see this curiosity, this sad curiosity of this whale that is uh, it's highly unlikely this whale is going to make it. Now, I'll have more on this story a bit later. As, as you've uh, already seen on here now, Wayne Ledwell was here, gave it a great shot, had the whale well beyond the Kyle. It looked as though there might be some hope, but that whale just insisted on coming back. So I'll speak with Mr. Ledwell as well as the Mayor of Harbor Grace a little bit later on here and now. Debbie? Okay, thanks so much, Anthony. We will check in with you just a little bit later. To Happy Valley Goose Bay now, where students in residence at the College of the North Atlantic are unhappy with how the college dealt with complaints. The students complained about a security guard who they say acted inappropriately. They say the guard made inappropriate sexual comments around the students and would enter the girls' shower unannounced. Here now is Jacob Barker has our exclusive story. Many here at the Grand River Hall residences on the CNA campus in Happy Valley Goose Bay. It's their first time away from home and somewhere where both they and their families want to know that they're safe. But according to these complaints, many of the students in these residences that were there this year did not feel that way. This was Kendra Williams' first year in residence. When one particular security guard was on duty, she didn't feel very safe. But I know that the girls that had comments towards him don't feel safe. I don't feel safe around him. He should not be there. Like, he has the master key, which means you can enter any room at any time. She says the guard would make sexual comments towards girls and give vivid descriptions of sexual violence. Some very detailed stuff. And this. He just entered the bathroom while... I know it was me and some of the other girls were in shower and he'd enter. None of the other security guards goes in while they're there. Most of them, well, they always knock before they enters. Several students brought their concerns to the college in writing, outlining different ways the guard had made them feel uncomfortable, and they weren't just from women, but also from men, like Aaron Dyson. I seen him check out a few of the girls. Yeah, I seen him when they walk out, he looked back at me and says, Oh, I wish I was younger. 
I'll be hired after that. And already that's like, no. He was content when the college took the step to suspend the guard after they gave their initial complaints, but dismayed when just a week later the guard was back at his post. Then we got word back that our names had been withdrawn because we wanted to keep our names anonymous. Dyson says eventually the college investigated again. This time students were given the choice to write out their complaints or videotape them. He says the security guard remained suspended since that process unfolded, but he thinks the college should have listened the first time around. We spent weeks writing up the incident reports and writing up the complaints, and for all that work just to be blown away is just, it was kind of an insult. Williams wants assurances that this time he's gone for good. I hope that he do not return. CBC did try and reach the man that these complaints are against to try and get his side of the story by phone and by email and even through Facebook, but he didn't respond to any of our requests. CNA said it wouldn't comment on the matter because it is a human resources issue, but it did say it's aware of the issue and it's using its protocols and its procedures to deal with the matter. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, it's time to turn our attention to the weather and to welcome meteorologist Colette Kennedy, who's arrived from uh, Ontario to pitch in a little while, a couple of weeks, while we're still looking for Ryan's replacement. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and be here live and in person. I know. And I'm not trying to fill Ryan's shoes. We, we wear a totally different size, and I don't think he wears heels. So, uh, Not that we know of. I'm well, sorry, Ryan. You, you never know. I know he has a good sense of humor. He but does. Yeah, I can so, get away with it. I'm so happy to be here because yeah. I've, you know, we've worked together before, of course, yes. but I always from Ontario, and so yeah. I love that I'm here. And uh, what was the shock of the temperature like when you realized <laughs> <laughs> you went out the door in St. John's? Well, it was pretty drastic, and that's just because back in Ontario, you know, they've been having heat advisories, 30 degrees when I got on the plane. So, okay, it was a bit of a shock. <laughs> and speaking of temperatures, you know, we actually do have a nice warming trend. You may have already felt it a little bit today. And uh, so, yeah, temperatures kind of creeping up there a little bit, but we have a real warming trend that's coming uh, as we get a little bit further into this week. I'm just looking and showing you the current temperatures at the moment here. And you can see for St. John's sitting at nine degrees. We've got double digits and Gander at 11. Labrador City, 16 right now, but had upper teens earlier today for the highs. But there are some of those readings. And what's important about this heat back in Ontario is that it's moving from west to east, just like our weather patterns do. So we're gonna see some of that warmth come. The only thing is it comes with some moisture and you're already feeling that, I know that. Western central parts of the island, we've already got the rain that's pushing through. Windy conditions on the way too for the Avalon as well. Already seeing that elsewhere. Some heavy rainfall back towards the southwest. We may see as much as 60 to 80 millimeters of rainfall there. So a warning that is in place, but the rain pushing in towards St. John's. I'll give you the timeline on that when I come back and also the timeline and the actual temperatures of the warm up that's coming. St. John's City Councilor Debbie Hanlon used a prisoner of war to market her real estate business. People were critical of the ad. She says so she's the victim. That story coming up. Premier Dwight Ball says his party is strong coming out of this weekend's annual convention. Delegates took a vote on the party leadership and they're sticking with their guy. Here and now's Garrett Barry was there. His party is behind in the polls and he's not as popular as the other guy. But on this night, it didn't seem to matter. To reporters in this room, take your pens out, take your notepads out, because I'm going to say something right now, and I'm going to guarantee to every single person in this room, and you can quote me on it, mark it down, I am guaranteeing you that we will win the election in 2019. That cheering crowd full of liberal delegates. 79% of them voted against a leadership review, sticking by their guy. You know, he has taken on a huge challenge. He's delivered. Uh, you know, anytime anybody passing out the spoonful of Buckley's is going to get a sour face, and he's had to put out a lot of Buckley's uh, in, in his time. Now the race to 2019 is on. Osborne wants back in, and some familiar faces might be getting into the ring. George, welcome back to the family, buddy. 
<laughs> uh, are you going to be running for the Liberals in 2019? I'll talk to the family about that. Yeah, that's going to be a consultation that's going to happen around a kitchen table, probably. Maybe in Harbour, Maine. You never know. <laughs> Liberals will have their help from volunteers, some young. Um, I think we need to continue to engage with people across the province and let them know exactly all the good things we're doing. Some not so young. No, I'm not going to be knocking doors because I can't walk around, I can drive around, but then I can't get out of my car and go to the door. And I will use my telephone and I will call all over New Newfoundland to get this man elected because he's next to God when it comes to winning an election. And Today, those fiery Liberal delegates have returned to their home districts. The party is certainly hoping they can keep that fighting spirit alive into the next election, which could be just 477 days away. Garrick Berry, CBC News, Gander. A powerful earthquake in Japan has left at least three people dead and injured more than 200. Japan is one of the world's most seismically active countries. Fortunately, this one did not trigger a tsunami. The magnitude 6.1 tremor struck just north of Osaka, rattling the city of more than 2.5 million people southwest of Tokyo. It happened at the height of the morning rush. Trains and flights stopped for hours. Store items, including these bottles of wine, were tossed from shelves. Adam Walsh has more from Tokyo on the quake. Officials here are still assessing the number of casualties and the damage from the jolt that shook the Osaka region just before 8 a.m. One of the deaths was a nine-year-old girl. She was killed when a wall collapsed while she was on her way to school. Authorities have had to deal with three house fires as well as cracked pipes under roads that have caused some flooding. At one point, tens of thousands were without power. Some 100,000 homes are still without gas and it could take a week before that's restored. Hundreds have since taken shelter in temporary evacuation centers. The quake also halted train services, including the country's Shinkansen bullet train, leaving thousands affected. The region's nuclear reactors have reported no issues so far. The Japanese government says it is doing everything it can to help with rescue and recovery efforts. Japan is built to withstand earthquakes. If this was somewhere else, the damage could have been much worse. But people are still bracing for more. Officials here are warning another big quake could hit in the coming days. Adam Walsh, CBC News, Tokyo. Carl English has a new job. The St. John's Edge announced that the league's most valuable player is now the interim general manager of the team. That means English will be involved in recruiting a new head coach and new players. He'll also continue to be involved in community relations. As for whether or not he'll play next season, a team spokesperson says English is open to that but hasn't yet made a decision. Well, there was a lovely birthday celebration in Toronto for a Newfoundland man. This performance of the hit musical Come From Away ended with a birthday surprise for Harry Whalen, who turns 98 today. He grew up in Gander, where the musical takes place. His daughter asked the cast if they would pay tribute to her dad when they saw the show, and they were more than happy to oblige. Ninety-eight years young by the look of him, Waylon is a father of four, grandfather of seven, and great-grandfather of four. And that means there were plenty of people to celebrate this milestone with him. And you can see, you can see on the, you can see the, the ridge line on the whale were sort of concave. That shouldn't be like that. That animal should be totally round. So that'll give you an indication of like what kind of body condition is in, and that's pretty much what, you, what we can tell by look, what you can tell by looking at it that this animal doesn't look healthy. Wayne Ledwell did everything he could to try to save this magnificent whale behind me. That creature is slowly dying. Was it doomed? We'll talk about that after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. St. John City Councilor Debbie Hanlon is coming under fire for a marketing campaign promoting her real estate business. Her ads called Keeping It Real Estate used tips and true stories to sell her service. The latest one has sparked backlash and she says she's being bullied. Here and Now's Katie Breen's been following the story and is with us live. Katie, what can you tell us? Well, Hanlon's marketing team used a prisoner of war to make a pun. Now people are questioning her judgment and calling the ad insensitive. This is the ad. It tells the story of Young Kun Jun, a soldier who was enlisted against his will and then captured and recaptured, forced to fight three sides of the same war. Hanlon used his story to say she fights for her clients. Well, that's just a marketing play on words. The idea was it's an interesting fact. That's all. The ads are distributed in hard copy and posted online. Hanlon says she's used the soldier's ad before without issue. Backlash came after it was reposted Saturday. And I get a phone call from some woman screaming at me on the phone saying I'm a racist pig and, and a bunch of other things too. Me, I'm, like, I'm so shocked. I, I think I'm, I started to cry. I, was, I couldn't believe it had happened. Hanlon says the comments she's getting online aren't about the ad calling the criticism a personal attack. That particular ad about soldier Jung, can't even say his last name, from Korea, that's been posted at least eight times in the last three years. So all of a sudden, someone's got a problem with it? No, this is online bullying at its, at its finest, and I'm the victim. Hanlon has taken down the ad and is apologizing to anyone it's offended. She's also removed this one that shows a deceased Puerto Rican taxi driver propped up in his cab at his wake. He can't give you a lift because he's dead, the ad reads, before telling people to phone her if they need a ride related to her business. While both ads have been removed, she plans to continue using others from the same campaign. Well, of course, keeping it real estate, yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, that's part of my marketing campaign. Probably won't be soldiers in it anymore, <laughs> but definitely uh, keeping it real estate, yeah, people love them. Another one of the ads in the campaign explains if you dissolve Viagra in water and use that water to water your plants, the plants will stay, quote, erect for up to a week longer. The tagline with that one, Hanlon says if you want a real estate agent to work hard, call her. Now, that ad is still available online, but the reaction it's getting is stiff. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. And I'm Anthony Germain, live in Harbour Grace, where the big story today, of course, is the story of this poor minky whale just behind me, this, just up this side of the uh, Kyle, of course. And if you've ever been to Harbour Grace, you know the Kyle almost identifies the community. Well, today, a lot of people who aren't from the community have been coming by to see this poor creature. At first, there was some hope for it. Earlier today, I spoke with a man who tried to rescue uh, the animal, Wayne Ledwell. Well, we got a call at 7 o'clock this morning that, that, that there was a whale in, in here, and... Um, uh, stranded and, uh, and and it was a single whale so initially I thought that it would be very much like a lot of them that we do see that there's an animal that wasn't well uh, because animals, uh, whales don't really belong on beaches and or in uh, resting on a, in a shallow area. So we came down pretty much with the plan to go talk to people, see what was going on with the animal first, whether or not there was something on it that it had some could be some gear on it or something that it had dragged in there and couldn't get out of it uh, or whether or not it had been hit by a ship or some other uh, bitten by uh, maybe killer whales you don't know and uh, and so we, the plan what we did we went out and looked at the animal and see if there was anything that we could say there was caused it to be in there but there was nothing it was just it was an animal that was uh, that was pretty thin uh, with uh, ribs uh, uh, visible uh, and it looked to me like as I thought it would be a sick animal. Right. Now you tried to get it out, you actually got it past the Kyle and then it came back in. So what's your sense of what's wrong with this animal behind us? Uh, well, yeah, it got, he went out, he had lots of access to open water. We got it, it, it more or less went out on its own. We were there around it and, uh, and, and, and it could have gone on, but it didn't want to go out. It wanted to come back in on the on a beach and it was probably Probably just eat that the reason it could be in there, it could probably not want to drown. Uh, that's uh, fairly. That's what I think. Some of these thoughts that, that, that could have be why these animals come ashore. 
um, and it's easy for it to be resting where it is resting uh, easier on his lungs. It doesn't have to extend, expend uh, very much energy to go swim around, to be swimming around to, uh, up and down. So it, uh, it, it, and it's got, it's pretty much on a soft bottom out there. So, so it sounds as though you say basically this this animal has has chosen its time. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, the, a lot of those animals die. Everybody dies, and uh, uh, and it uh, some we don't see a lot of the a lot of this coastline so huge. I'm sure there's other animals ashore on be that, that have come ashore on beaches and similar thing happens to them. But unfortunately, it's or it's right in the community, and there's a lot of activity and a lot of interest uh, in it. Uh, and people want action to do something. What can we do to save the animal? And we tried pretty much to do as much as we could, uh, try to see if we could get had enough energy to get on the go and get out, but obviously it didn't have that. It came back in again. So um, I think the best what we could do here is to talk to people and explain about the, the history of the animal, what kind of animal it is, probably why it, why it's here, and uh, and maybe why it still wants us to, to stay here. All right, Wayne, appreciate your time. Thank you. Right, thank you. Now, another part of a story like this, and we've seen this play out in Newfoundland time and time again, when a dead whale washes up on your community, especially a pretty tourist community like this, who's going to pay to remove it when this whale dies, as expected to happen? We'll discuss that a little bit later on Here and Now. And most people don't find something as exquisite as this in, in, uh, in their lifetime. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of rock. Just how rich is the Boise's Bay nickel deposit? Our Terry Roberts looks at the mine's underground expansion and what it could mean for the province.
Welcome back once again, and once again, I uh, want to welcome Colette Kennedy to our program. But before we chat about the weather, Colette, we're mm -hmm. going to introduce you to a young entrepreneur who, thanks to his dad, is taking his ice business to the bank. Just have a look. This is six-year-old Jax Ryland of Lansomore, Labrador, and since icebergs have been drifting into his backyard, uh, he started selling Bergie bits for $4 a bag. <laughs> so the goal here is for him to earn enough money to buy a motorbike. So he sold 60 bags so far. So he's kind of got a ways to go still, Debbie. Uh, but with Dad doing all the heavy lifting for him, literally, sounds like uh, Jax is in business here. He's what in smart little guy, he right? He really is, and he's in the right part of the province to collect those briggy <laughs> bits. Uh, I really don't want much ice, though, where no. I, at least the temperatures that the ice uh, can mimic, you know? Right. We feel like we're done with the frost advisors, yeah. right? So, yeah, let's hopefully be done with uh, all of that as well. You know, I've only been here 20, less than 24 hours-ish, <laughs> yes. and I already have, like, back in Ontario, it's lemonade stands, right? So I already have a new story for the different kinds of things that you could do. My goddaughter does lemonade stands. Well, now you can do uh, Berkey bits, but it'll just be ice from the corner store, I yeah. think, in that case. Not the same, is it? No. No. So but you we, were saying earlier we're going to have a little bit of a warm-up here. We do have a warm-up coming. Really looking forward to that. Unfortunately, it comes with some rain. So if we have a look at the rainfall warning that's in place, um, now there are a few different areas that will be dealing with the rains. So it's for southwestern sections of the province where we're actually going to have something in the neighborhood of 60 to 80 millimeters of rainfall, which is possible. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Elsewhere, we're not going to see such a significant amount of rain, but we do have that warning that's in place again down to the southwest. And that's going to have that impact where we'll see not only the rainy conditions, but we're talking about some very, very windy conditions, not only through here, but we're going to see those windy conditions all the way over towards the Avalon Peninsula, up towards the Northern Peninsula as well. So just to start things off, kind of taking a look at what's going on with those current temperatures out there. It was a bit of a warm up today, not a bad day. Started off with a lot of sunshine for St. John's and then those clouds building in right now at nine degrees, uh, double digit still, as I was saying earlier, for Gander at 11, Happy Valley Goose Bay, you guys at 11 too, and Nain sitting at 14 degrees. In fact, Labrador City, it was upper teens. You can see some of the winds, not that significant yet. It's over the next 24 hours, even as soon as tonight. We'll start to see the wind starting to ramp up, but really by tomorrow afternoon, mostly from a southerly direction. That one area with the wind warning, but you'll notice they're going to be gusty all along the south coast. We'll be talking about winds that at times will gust towards 60 to 80 kilometers an hour. We even have that potential towards the north coast as well. So kind of sandwiched between two areas of high pressure, that low in between, and that's what's squeezing us in here with the rainfall moving across the island and and it's on our doorstep here for the Avalon. And so what we're going to see as we take this through into the evening hours, I actually think very shortly we'll start to see a little bit of drizzle in the next few hours moving in. So it's going to be light showery stuff at first, then that rainfall becoming more significant, just like it already is elsewhere across the rock and that rain continuing through tomorrow. There may be some periods where we get some breaks, uh, but otherwise we're going to see it towards the east all the way towards tomorrow evening. So your morning outlook, a look at the temperatures, as I say, it's going to be a little cooler to the north, but we're still seeing some milder readings uh, across Newfoundland. And then with that rainfall, as I continue to push this forward for you. You can see a drying trend slowly, maybe even some sunny breaks beginning to develop, but still a chance of showers for the west, for the northern peninsula, central regions into the afternoon beginning to seeing things break up as well. But elsewhere, we're still talking about that rain, as I say, till tomorrow evening. So the highs tomorrow, St. John's going to feel pretty good at least, even if it's wet. 13, Marystown 16, very breezy conditions though through there. And for Grand Falls, Windsor, 20 degrees, St. Anthony 13 for you there, Cornerbrook 12, and all the way down towards Porto Bass, we're talking about 13 degrees for the highs. Okay, that's just kind of the precursor. The real warm up comes after tomorrow. I'll tell you all about that when I come back, Debbie. Thanks, Colette. Looking forward to that. 
Well, we've had a week to digest the news about Voises Bay that Valet will spend more than $2 billion for an underground expansion at the mine. But just how rich are the mineral deposits there? And is there another Voises Bay just waiting to be discovered somewhere in Labrador? Here now's Terry Roberts went looking for answers to those questions. You're looking at a metallurgical core sample from Voises Bay, many times heavier than a similar sized rock. And for a geology expert like Derek Wilton, something very special. So how do you think geologists reacted when they pulled this out of the ground and they, and they saw what you saw right here? <laughs> uh, they probably went out and bought a lot of shears. Rich concentrations of nickel, copper, cobalt. Most people don't find something as exquisite as this in, in, uh, in their lifetime. About $15 billion worth of minerals. That's how much has been hauled out of the famous ovoid in northern Labrador. The ore deposit they're mining right now is like a big bowl of massive metal. That surface mine will be exhausted in about four years. But don't expect the shovels to go silent. Valet is going underground, where multiple ore bodies about the same size and even larger than the ovoid have been found saying it will extend the life of the mine by at least 15 years. But most agree, including the people at Valet, that's very conservative. We believe it's going to be more than 15 years. We know there's more ore there to, to get out. It's been called one of the most substantial mineral discoveries in Canada in more than a generation, described as low cost, long life. And the growth in sales of electric vehicles is only bolstering its value. Some experts call Voises Bay a perfect battery metals mine because of numbers like these. It has um, about 3% nickel, about 2% copper, and a little bit less than 1% of, of cobalt. Another number about to grow is the workforce, from the current 450 to more than 900 when the expansion is complete. If I was somebody that was working up there, I'd be quite happy. And with exploration activity increasing, Wilton is convinced that another deposit is out there to be found. It is potentially a treasure trove. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. This animal, sadly, is going to die. It's only a matter of time. And once it does, who's responsible for the cleanup? That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now, live from Harbor Grace. Of course, a big story here is this poor creature, this minky whale that has beached itself despite some valiant attempts to try to save it. They managed to pull it way out. It just insisted on coming back in. It seems to be just a matter of time before this animal dies. And then, of course, it's that old story in Newfoundland. Who's responsible for the cleanup? Earlier today, I spoke with the mayor of the town. Well, Mayor Coombs, obviously it's been uh, quite a day here, that poor creature behind us. Uh, what kind of day has it been here? It's been quite hectic, as you can see from the traffic and everything in, uh, uh, up on the road. Uh, got some concerns there, but uh, our concern right now is for the, the, the whale and the mammal and see what will happen to it. We were hoping that it would get out of the harbour, but no such luck, and it looks like it's found a resting place. Right now, in the event, oftentimes when these whales do this, it's because they've decided it's time to, to end things, for lack of a better expression. What concerns do you have from that point of view? We've seen so many times communities end up with a dead whale in their, in their tourist area. Well, we spoke about it before we went on the air, and it's, uh, from what I understand, it becomes a municipal a responsibility, and so it's something we're going to have to sit down and evaluate, and uh, hopefully he'll or she'll get out the harbour, but it's not going to happen. Right. We, we know we've got to deal with it. Whatever regulations there are, we'll follow. So if this whale dies, what are the, what are the options? Obviously, be, I don't want to talk about cost, but physically, how, what do you do with a dead whale? I, I guess from our point of view, and it's just off the top of my head right now, that we look at tr trying to get towed out the harbour or something like that. That's, that's all regulated by environment and fisheries and everything else because they've been around. So that's what I think right now, but we'll have to get that confirmed also. But it, the town certainly got a responsibility also. You don't want it here on the, the beach all summer or nothing else. Right, and for people who don't know Harbor Grace, I mean, the, the beds and breakfast that people stay at, they're just they're within smelling distance. Oh, they're just down the road and little brook here, people trout in the brook that we see coming out there. And uh, no, it's something that we got to deal with and we'll get it put to bed and work with whatever authorities, as I said, fisheries or whoever, and get it done. All right. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed and maybe this whale will just decide to swim out there, but it doesn't look too good right now, but we'll hope for the best. I, I think you're right, but it's, I, I think it's found his resting place up by the coil. All right, Mayor Coombs, thank you very much. Thank you. Stop traffic here in Harbor Grace today all day, and it continues as people have finished their supper to come down and check out the whale. And that includes a lot of young people, and if I'm lucky, uh, Debbie, I might be able to get one of those young people on the air before the end of the show. Debbie. Thanks so much, Anthony. Well, a decision is looming for the B.C. government on whether to renew the leases on 20 fish farms. Once seen as the savior of dying coastal towns, now B.C.'s Atlantic salmon farms are more controversial than ever, and the government is under pressure to shut them down. Greg Rasmussen has the story. So we're on a fairly remote section of the B.C. coast, and this is a salmon farm. This is what the controversy is all about. There are pens, giant pens, underneath the ocean here, but they're open on all sides. And what happens is there are hundreds of thousands of fish in these pens and they're being fed. They're also being treated with various chemicals uh, to deal with disease and lice outbreaks and so on. And the concern is that diseases from these fish, as well as some of the chemical treatments, are harming the wild fish stocks. And opponents say it's time for these farms to go. They're cheap, is what it is. Um, moving this operation out onto land is going to cost the, them a lot of money and they should be the ones paying for that. I'm 100% sure these farms are killing off wild salmon. When you look everywhere in the world, wild salmon go into precipitous decline as soon as this industry operates. On the other side is the aquaculture industry, which says these farms are incredibly important to the economy, especially here in fairly remote sections of BC where there aren't a lot of jobs and traditional industries such as logging and commercial fishing are fading away. The industry admits there are problems with these farms, but nothing that can't be managed. We know how to keep our fish healthy. We know how to uh, ensure that uh, we're mitigating any potential risk, and, and we know that we can coexist uh, alongside a healthy wild fishery and help conserve uh, Pacific salmon. All of this is coming to a head now for a couple of reasons. For one, Washington State, just south of the border, is saying no more to Atlantic salmon in this type of pen. In BC, they're looking at a deadline on renewing the leases to use the oceans and the nearby land for these farms. That deadline is coming up and a decision has to be made. There are also court cases underway. So the question of whether these farms will remain in years to come remains to be seen. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, near Port McNeil, BC. Donald Trump is defending his administration's tough new border policy, separating migrant children from their parents.
Well, it's time now to meet the first of our young athletes of the day. This is Becca Warren. Becca, play, Becca plays hockey as a Timbit for the Morriston Mariners. I love it, a Timbit. When the hockey season ends, you can find Becca playing t-ball through the summer. So congratulations to Becca. Looks great in her uniform. And our second athlete of the day is an active four-year-old who's involved in Mike Foley's karate class in paradise. This is Rory Whalen. And when Rory isn't practicing his karate moves, he enjoys going to swimming class. That's at the summit in Mount Pearl. And congratulations to Rory. Debbie, can I say that, you know, kids in uniforms of any type are so adorable, but there's a karate school near where I live and kids in karate uniforms just <laughs> kill me. The smaller, the better. He's got such a sweet face. Aww. So they are our young athletes of the day, Rory and Becca. So we are going to press you for some better weather. It's going to improve, <laughs> as you were saying, later in the week. Yeah. And uh, I know we're not going to get the heat that New York is experiencing, but right. anything warmer is good. Right, that's a good point because uh, the heat advisory is not just in other parts of Canada, but seeing them all through the U.S. as well. Mm -hmm. Well, some of that heat's kind of coming our way, but uh, if we have a look at the temperatures, it's not going to maybe get that warm, but uh, have a look at some of the readings along the eastern seaboard. 32 degrees, Boston is at 31, that's New York at 32, so still they are looking at some extreme heat there. I know it was a fairly decent day today, of course, with the temperatures being a little bit, uh, feeling a little bit better, especially with some of that sunshine out there and through the Maritimes, some nice readings even getting into the low 20s. Still, the current temperature at Fredericton sitting at 20 degrees. It's just that we have to contend with these wet conditions as well. And it's already been raining across most of the island. It's just that last little push to the east we're seeing into the evening hours. Heavier stuff really coming later towards 11 or 12, but we may see it beginning as some drizzle very shortly. See how it's kind of over the northern sections of the Avalon and not so much further south. Uh, what everyone's going to experience through here, though, are going to be the southerly winds, south to southwest, very breezy, especially into tomorrow but we're seeing those pick up as well even tonight and for southwestern parts of the island we are looking there at a rainfall warning 60 to 80 millimeters of rain now I'm rolling this forward to Tuesday morning you can see rain still for the east central regions beginning to taper off a little further west sunny breaks well maybe into the afternoon hours but still a chance I'm keeping a chance of some showers as that cold front winds through as well by Tuesday evening still some wet conditions for the Avalon but then getting it out of here in terms of amounts for St. John's. It looks like I'm seeing 10 to 13 millimeters or so overnight tonight, say another 10 to 15 tomorrow. So we'll call it around 20 to 25 millimeters, could be a little bit more than that. And then continuing to roll things forward as we head into Wednesday morning, we're beginning to get a clearing trend across the province. Still a lot of low cloud hanging around in the east. Now let's take this a little further and show you what's coming because another warm front poking through here, that's going to pump those temperatures up on Wednesday and yes a cold front going through as we're getting into Thursday but for eastern sections still on the warm side so that means Wednesday and Thursday some milder temperatures and if we go even beyond that yes we do have some of those rain showers that have to push through the winds won't be too bad it's in fact that southerly flow that's actually although it's breezy tomorrow really breezy in some cases with winds 60 to 80 kilometers an hour it does mean that we're at least going to see those temperatures up so a look at western Labrador you can see even that trend there as it dries out towards Thursday and the temperature by the end of the week into the weekend by 17. We're going to see readings mostly in the mid teens for eastern sections of Labrador, western Newfoundland. Here's where we go. 19 degrees on Wednesday, 18 on Thursday, and you may get some sunny breaks tomorrow afternoon. Central regions, we've got the rain and the patchy fog as well. We'll see that fog in the east too, but I'm taking Wednesday up to 21. And for St. John's, 13 for tomorrow with some patchy fog, the rain, the winds, but look at Wednesday and Thursday. I promised it. I there. I'm hoping to deliver it. I haven't been here very long, but let's hope we're into the upper teens as we head into Wednesday and into Thursday. Debbie? Thanks so much, Colette. In national and international news now, the Trump administration isn't backing down from one of its most controversial stances yet, the practice of splitting up migrant families at the border. 2,000 children have been separated from their parents over six weeks, part of a zero-tolerance approach to illegal immigration. The CBC's Lindsay Duncombe has the details. 
White House, this is a safety issue. The president believes criminals are arriving across the border. And if the only way to put those migrants behind bars is to separate them from the children they arrived with, then that's the way it has to be. Even as images of children at the border continue to go viral, Donald Trump defended the policy. The United States will not be a migrant camp and it will not be a refugee holding facility. Democrats, human rights groups, the UN haven't shaken the president from that position, but there has been condemnation from unexpected voices. In a column for the Washington Post, former Republican First Lady Laura Bush wrote, I appreciate the need to enforce and protect our international boundaries, but this zero tolerance policy is cruel, it is immoral, and it breaks my heart. To his critics, Trump blames the Democrats, saying this issue could be addressed if they would sign on to his larger immigration plans, which seek to reduce legal immigration. There are reports that some Republicans are worried that this issue may harm them in the upcoming midterm elections. Are pictures of weeping children enough for them to speak out against the president? We may know more tomorrow when Donald Trump meets with lawmakers on Capitol Hill. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. The tables turned for one Calgary family's Father's Day celebration, with Dad saying a big thank you to his eight-year-old son. The boy's quick thinking saved his father's life. Jennifer Lee has the details. He stayed calm, but I'm like, I'm just like so afraid and shocked that my dad's having a stroke. Eight-year-old Max Pozo put down his iPad as soon as he noticed something was wrong. He was just sitting on the couch. His left side wasn't really that much moving. I told my dad to do the three tests, the uh, arms, smile, and the speech. The speech, I thought was okay, kind of bad, kind of okay. Arms, good, but the smile was just one side up, one side down. Max called 911, and Mike was rushed to hospital where he was given clot-busting drugs. Just blessed that I've got a, an amazing son, for sure. Um, I think... Uh, I, I plug his ears for this one, but I think I'm, I'm, in, I'm in debt to him, ironically. It turns out a jump rope for heart event had been held at Max's school just five days earlier. That's where Max learned the signs of stroke. Donna Hastings with the Heart and Stroke Foundation says they recently started teaching kids what to look for. This underscores the importance of everyone learning the signs of stroke. Children, they can be at home with their parents, their grandparents, other family members. And in this case, Max was the one that chose to act upon what he learned just five days after it happened. Max and his dad, who is now fully recovered, hope others will take the time to learn the signs and potentially save another life. Jennifer Lee, CBC News, Calgary. And it is time now for our picture of the day. This is where you get a chance to have a look at this scenic view. And, you know, I think it's ironic that I'm asking you to tell us where this is because <laughs> I think it's gorgeous, but I have to admit, I wasn't sure until I looked it up. Do you know where this is, Debbie? I, I really don't. It could be so many parts of the uh, province, maybe the south coast. I'll just go with that. It's a beautiful picture. We'll I, find out, I guess, after yes, the break. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely.
Welcome back once again. Well, a songwriter from the west coast of the province will soon perform at Country Music Week, and the opportunity could make his music dreams come true. You want a man with a slow hand. You want a lover with an easy touch. Sounds fantastic. That is Jason Benoit. He's one of three finalists in Sirius XM's Top of the Country competition. Benoit is from the Halibu First Nation Fox Island River, and he's already had four top 30 hits on the Canadian country charts. He'll soon be songwriting in Nashville before performing in front of industry judges in September. Benoit submitted this cover of Slow Hands, a song by the Pointer Sisters, for the competition. Good luck to him. Well, a house listing video in Upper Coverdale, New Brunswick, is getting a lot of attention online thanks to the realtor's dance moves. It's different. Just have a look. <laughs> That's Dylan Mahaney doing a dance call the floss, and he's doing it all over the house. Mahani keeps a deadpan expression on his face throughout the video, which is going viral. More than 60,000 views already. Mahaney says he got the idea from a realtor in San Diego and he wanted to do something to get the house noticed. So, has it worked? Here's what he told CBC Radio this afternoon. Not just yet, but we have had lots of activity on it. There's a lot of people slow driving uh, by the house, uh, kind of checking it out, um, which is great. That'll turn into showings. Um, but yeah, we're we're definitely on the right track. We're getting we're getting the traction that we need to. Um, the market's great in Moncton, but we're still not seeing. Um, you know, the fast action that you would in Vancouver or uh, Toronto. Okay, well, let's head back to Anthony now and the stranded whale in Harbor Grace. Anthony. Well, Debbie, as you can see, people of all ages have been coming here all day to check out this, uh, this sad sight. And I have two uh, young people with me right now, Alyssa and Brittany. Alyssa, your thoughts on this whale behind us? I think it's an absolute sin, and there definitely could have been more done to save the whale. And Brittany, what do you think? I think it's a sin, but I think when it's his time to go, it's his time to go. Okay. I, the whale could have been brought out, but he did come back. Right. Well, listen, I appreciate your time, and, um, and thank you very much, and we'll keep our fingers crossed, but it does look as though uh, the whale's not going to make it. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right. Well, uh, Debbie, that's basically it uh, from Harbor Grace. A lot of sadness, but uh, as that young woman, Brittany, said, also uh, a lot of people saying the animal's time has come and it's chosen its resting place. Debbie. It is a very sad story. Um, hopefully the whale will not be suffering too much longer one way or another. Thanks very much, Anthony. All right, Debbie. Okay. Um, I think we're going to have we're going to have a look now at that photo of the day. At that photo, absolutely yeah. gorgeous. It is absolutely beautiful. So are you ready for it? Here it is. Is that what you were thinking at home? Did anybody guess that? <laughs> There's a big prize. No, I'm just kidding. There isn't a big prize, but you get bragging rights. Yes, we love it if you can send your photos yeah. into us. That's uh, fantastic. It is Little Bay Islands, and this uh, photo came courtesy of Michael Parsons. So that is on the north coast there near. I had to look it up myself. I admit yeah. it. It's near Beachside. And anybody who's on the south coast is thinking, why would Debbie guess the south coast? Uh, you know, the hills don't look like that. But, but anyway. you said that to yourself. <laughs> I heard you say that in the commercial break. You're like, oh, yeah, I know. I know. So you knew. And uh, of course, as you were saying, Colette, keep them coming. Uh, we appreciate everybody sending in the pictures. Mm -hmm. That is our program for tonight, here and now for tonight. Thanks very much for being with us and welcoming Colette Kennedy, who's here for yeah. two weeks. Great to have you on board. Oh, thank you, Debbie, so much. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here with all of you. See you all tomorrow.